Okay. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Congresswoman Norton and Congressman Davis uh, for convening this panel. Uh, even before the verdict, it should be announced. And with that kind of prescience and that kind of insight about why we are confronting the issues that we are confronting here today. And to all of the distinguished uh, colleagues here in Congress, and of course, to Mr. Johns for that great comment, and Attorney Crump and Mr. Martin for their courage and their valor, and uh, Mr. Nfume uh, for his sharp insight. I want to talk about uh, young men, teens and youth. I myself was a teen father, uh, lived on welfare for three years, didn't go to college until I was 21. So I understand some of the existential drama that attaches to black boys, males, and men who have been particularly subject to the arbitrary stigma and pathology that attaches to young men in American society, but leave aside the incredible valor and the vitality of their struggles to claim decent spaces in American society. What do teens who are black and male face in our culture? Well, let's be honest, there's a cultural backdrop all black people live under suspicion. Trayvon Martin is but the most ready and apt metaphor for the suspicion to which we are subject. Black humanity has been suspected from the beginning of our sojourn in American society. I don't need to give a history lesson about that. The great Thomas Jefferson, the architect of Monticello and the Declaration of Independence also wrote notes in, on Virginia where he questioned the cerebral abilities and the intellectual acuity and the reason of black people, even as at night, retiring from his study, engaged in relations with a young woman whose loins trapped his logic. So that the reality of our humanity being under suspicion is critical as the backdrop to understand the unfolding and evolving perception of black people in America. Our humanity has been questioned and our intelligence has been questioned. As a result of that, black teens inherit a culture where the suspicion and skepticism about their humanity and their intelligence are part and parcel of what we deal with on the daily. This is why, for instance, uh, to echo Mr. Johns, we not only talk about black male stereotypes, we talk about black female stereotypes because had Rachel Gentile been believed, had the stereotypical representation that articulate her as, articulates her as somehow subhuman, and not just from white Americans, but black too, skeptical about what she is, speaking three languages, perhaps her testimony would have been believed and the outcome of the trial could have been shaped because black women are under vicious assault as well. And as a result of that, mothers mired in poverty help young black men come to birth and both of them receive the calumny and the slander of this culture. So young teens inherit a culture that unconsciously and consciously engages in the skepticism and suspicion of their existence. The educational system into which they are thrust expels them at a rate two and a half times greater than their white peers. So you in school and you get kicked out for stuff that your white peers don't. Not only that, they are subject to detention and also put in special education programs that target them specifically as being less capable intellectually. What happens then is that they are also subject to uh, the criminal justice system through nonviolent drug offenses. Even though the self-reporting of young white people suggests they do drugs about the same rate, if not a little bit more, than do black and other kids, it stands to reason. If you've got more disposable cash, you've got more time and capacity and ability to engage in nefarious activities on the extra legal sense. So the point is that white kids are doing drugs in the same way black kids are, but white kids are not being put in jail because they are not suspected. But because they are not viewed as likely to engage in that kind of behavior, they are not profiled. And so young black men, teens in general, are profiled, not just by the police department when they go into stores, 
retail profile, and you ain't got to be a teen to be subject to that. I got a black card, and yet I'm profiled. Though I painted it last night, it was green. But the, the point is that we are subject to that kind of racial and retail profile. The disproportionate number of black males who are put in the criminal justice system suggests to us that there is a targeting of African-American men, particularly teens, beginning in the 14, 15, 16 year age range that makes them subject to adult penalties in the criminal justice system. Many of these kids are tried as adults and the book, so to speak, of the law is thrown against them even for first time offenses. And then even more broadly, stereotypes of black male and youth identity. We could have an empirical crush to verify the assault of the state upon vulnerable black people, but I want to weave a narrative and tell a story to make you feel the compelling character of the assault on young black teens. Um, the reality is these stereotypes are out there. Even noted uh, Washington Post columnists say that, let's be honest, the hoodie is the uniform of the criminal, not for Mark Zuckerberg. Not for Bill O'Reilly, not for Gerardo, all of whom, uh, with the exception of Mr. Zuckerberg, have assaulted uh, black people and black teens for being engaged in the self-perpetuation of a legacy of assault upon them because of the clothing they wear. They wear. So that this sartorial profiling, this clothing profiling, suggests that black people can't even dress with the same kind of freedom that our white peers do, and in this case, young black teens can't because they will be automatically assumed to be a thug. Now, some people say, well, it's, it's your problem. It's hip-hop culture. Hip-hop created this. Really? Uh, before the rise of hip-hop culture 30, 35 years ago, black men were being profiled. Black teens were being seen as preternaturally given to inclinations to be criminal. So excuse me, that's not the case. Now, has some element of hip hop culture glorified and reinforced the devaluing of black life? Of course it has, but it's also spoken against it. Tupac said just the other day, I got lynched by some crooked cops, and to this day, them same cops on the beat getting major pay, but when I get my check, they taking tax out, so we paying the cops to knock the blacks out. Jay-Z said, God forgive me for my brash delivery, but I remember vividly what these streets did to me. Picture me allowing these clowns to nitpick at me, portray me like a pickany. So they are combating the vicious misrepresentation of black masculine identity by resorting to the very violence that is critical to American culture and American identity and the sense of machismo that young black people appropriate has been given to them by a culture that creates laws like stand your ground and that creates a gun industry that is obsessed to a nearly erotic intensity with guns as the manifestation of their manhood. They ain't invented the game, they plan it in their own way. So the reality is how do we deal with the stereotypical representations of young black people and now our friends on the right suggest it's black on black crime. Where you been? We've been talking about that. When Newtown happens, cameras are there. When Aurora happens, cameras are there. When Chicago happens, cameras are not there. But now we patholog pathologize those young black people. And by the way, black people have been marching from time immemorial against the vicious legacy of white supremacy that occupies black minds that leads us to kill each other, to hate each other, to despise the very presence that we represent. So we know about black on black crime as a reflection of a broader pathology and both of them must be arrested. But the reality is politicians don't show up from the White House down to the local level when black children's bodies are at stake. And when they do show up, they give us lectures about black family structure when we can look at most white people who commit crimes and they have obviously familial challenges that need to be articulated. And black on black crime, true, 94% of black people who are murdered are murdered by black people, but 86% of white people are, worded by, are, are, are murdered by white people. White on white crime is a reality in America today, but not assumed as such. So black teens are facing a state that stigmatizes them, a culture that demonizes them, a pop culture that both expresses their intent to be greater than they are, but reinforces some of their vulnerability. And so I would suggest then that what we do are a few things. First of all, the educational system has to be taken seriously as a locus classicus for the battles we need to wage. 
And how do we do that? We got to stop demonizing and stigmatizing our children. We've got to create alternative structures to admit multiple forms of learning. People learn in multiple ways. I mean, Jay-Z is a high school graduate, Tupac dropped out, Nas, eighth grade dropout, yet these are rhetorical geniuses. Who's wrong? The school or them? There's a difference between learning and education on the one hand and schools on the other. Schools are the institutional matrices that articulate our expression to educate each other and hold each other accountable. Learning is about the desire to be educated for a lifetime. And so we have to converge these two disparate meanings in some instances, figure out ways to acknowledge our children's learning styles, not to stigmatize and demonize them, don't send them to jail if they have a behavioral challenge, and figure out ways not to put them into detention, which becomes a feeding cell to jail, which becomes a warehouse for prison. Secondly, we've got to reduce the penalties for nonviolent drug offenses and for zero tolerance policies. Right. Now, We are not here. We are not here to have affirmative action for thugs, so to speak. We are here to say that everybody doing it, everybody ought to be taken in the same way to jail, or everybody should be given a break. Born poor and black, born with your back against the wall, many people, the President of the United States, in his brilliant memoir, talks about abusing marijuana. So had he been caught, put in jail, stigmatized, he'd have been a well-achieving young man, I'm sure, but he might have been standing on the sideline going, you know what, I could have been president. Yeah, right. So the reality is we have to be very careful how we stigmatize our youth and the public policies that we put in place and the laws must not unnecessarily, unduly, and disproportionately stigmatize those children. Thirdly, the president made a, a remarkable statement on race finally, and it is good that the president stood up. It was a result of pressure. We understand that. He said, initially I said, Trayvon could have been my son, but look at the metaphorical and analogical shift he made. He said, but no, I could have been Trayvon. And I would add, if I were the speechwriter for Mr. Obama, let me Dysonize that. <laughs> Not only could you have been Trayvon 35 years ago, you Trayvon now, right? Why? And I'll end. Because they are profiling Mr. Obama in the White House, asking about your transcripts from a man whose hair is thinner even than his skin, questioning you, trumping you in a very serious and vicious fashion, from people asking to see your birth certificate as if you were not American. You did it the way. People said they wanted to be done. You went to Columbia, graduated, Harvard Law School and graduated. You don't wear a hood. It can't be about a hoodie. It can't be about the demonization of a certain kind of sartorial choice. It is about the way in which black masculinity expresses a menace and a threat in American culture, both consciously and unconsciously, that needs to be decoupled in the collective imagination of America. And then finally, when we see these as structural problems, when we see that young girls are being demonized, put in prison more often as well, subject to the kind of vicious stereotypes that I talked about in regard to Rachel Gentile, and that they, along with young black boys, are the recipients of the outrageous indignity of being assumed not to be intelligent and not to be human. And so as I close, my plea and prayer is that as we craft social and public policy, we asked the White House to once again be a bully pulpit. Mr. Obama wrote one of the most brilliant memoirs on race we have. It would be like Michael Jordan was in the White House but couldn't talk about basketball. <laughs> Mr. Obama is acutely sensitive and keenly informed about the complicated matter. And the speech he delivered the other day was yet but a beginning. Now we need him and others to use their spots, spaces, and spirits in this culture to not only edify the conversation and to inform the analysis, but at the end of the day, to recognize that young black teens are children of God who deserve every protection. Because if those women on the jury understood Trayvon as their child, they may have felt his blood calling from the ground where George Zimmerman laid him to his rest. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Dyson. <laughs> it's my pleasure now to introduce to you Kawisi Nfume.